blood that led you to die on that cross in our place. That love that put you in a place where your father turned your back on you for us. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace that is new every day. We thank you, Lord, that there's nothing, nothing we can do that breaks it, that takes it too far, that stretches it beyond its, its, its limits and its boundaries. There's nothing I can do to separate me from your love. There's nothing I can say, there's nothing I can do, there's no one I can see that separates me from your amazing love. So Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can live in overwhelming victory, in absolute certainty of what you have done for us. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And Lord, we can come on this table now. We're going to break this bread and take this wine. There's a verse in, uh, a few verses in Mark chapter 14. So the night before Jesus died, he sat down with his followers. And he had a meal with them. And he used two parts of that meal to symbolize what was about to happen and what he was all about. And Jesus, the, the Mark says this, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. Jesus said this, this is my blood of the covenant or a promise which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. They were almost at the point where they could understand what he was all about. They hadn't seen his sacrifice on the cross just yet. That was to come. And in the moment it was to be awful and it was. But we have the benefit of looking back. We have the benefit of reading Jesus' words and understanding that's what he meant. That's what he meant. So when he said his, his body, with the, this bread, when he broke it, this is my body, he knew that he would allow his body to be broken for us. When he took the cup of wine and he said this is the blood of the covenant, he knew that his blood would be shed on that cross for us. That's what it's about. And that's why we take communion. That's why we call this communion. That's why we take this bread and this wine together. And it's purely as an act of remembrance. A few, a few, a few books later on, um, Paul talks about taking the, taking the bread and the wine and remembering what Jesus did for us. I want to say to everybody in this room, this bread and this wine is for you. Everybody. There's nobody excluded from this. All that we ask is this. But Jesus is your Lord and your Saviour. Don't ask you to be perfect. If you messed up, fess up. That's all we say. If you messed up, just, just let him know now. God, you know, I just I lay these things before you right now. But you knew him. But you know, we want everybody in this room to be able to come to this table and just take this bread and take this wine and celebrate and rejoice and be glad because of what he's done for us. So I'm going to ask Jerry. You mind helping me, please? Adij, would you help me as well, please? Just come and take the bread and the wine around for me, please, guys.
Just ask me to just sing that, that verse, that chorus again, my chains are gone. That is all about bringing us freedom. That's what that symbolizes. Nothing magical, it's just a symbol. You know, it's just a symbol of something that's absolutely incredible. And not just life changing, but eternity changing for us. Freedom that comes from Jesus' death on the cross. Would you sing that for me?
This part of our worship, we've just gone past, give this back, we just be set around. And it's just the offerings, that the tithes and offerings, and um, this is a not for profit organization. But now we just want to invest in God's kingdom, in God's plans for this community, for this valley. very often, but it's easy then this moment can we go. You know, this is so important because this is where we get to invest in God's kingdom. So I'm just going to pray over it and I'd like you to join in that prayer with me if it's okay. So Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Lord for your provision in our lives. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you uh, you bless us, Lord, you provide for us, Lord, and Lord, you create in us, Lord, a capacity, Lord, to bless you and your work in return. So Father, just pray, Lord, for this offering, Lord, is blessed, Lord, that it will Lord, it would multiply, Lord, in terms of, of the investment that it can become in your kingdom. Lord, as you have, Lord, give us wisdom, Lord, to use it wisely, Lord, to spend it wisely, to invest it wisely in the things of your kingdom, but that more and more people will become like us, knowing your love and your grace and your mercy in their lives. We bless you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Okay. I'm going to hand the microphone to Sam. I'm off to Sunday school. Thank you very much. Well, that's Martin as he goes. Morning, everyone. How are we doing? Are we doing all right? Good, good. Just sort out all my notes. Um, so, this morning. It's going to be a little bit challenging, it's going to be a little bit um, straight to the point, it's going to, you know, I think hopefully it'll, um, it'll talk straight to things that I've been, we've struggled with, or uh, things certainly that I've struggled with anyway as so I've been uh, preparing this. And I know everyone uh, thinks, oh, preaching this has got to be awesome, you know, getting to stand up and speak, and I think it's actually quite a, a, a tough thing, because usually the thing you're writing out, God, writing about, God usually tests you on it throughout the week. Um, and today we're back on the theme of generosity. Obviously, I, I learned that generosity is God's character. We had normally talk about God's uh, generous with our love. And this week, we're talking about generous with our forgiveness. So obviously, this week has been uh, one where people have annoyed me beyond belief. I've been so frustrated. We've had loads of fight. No, I, I am. We're, we're, we've been all right. But I, there have been moments where God has been bringing up things in my life where he's going... Actually, I think maybe we have to. I have to bring these things up. So I want you to know that as I say these things, they're coming very much from a place where I've been challenged on them this week. Now, again, I haven't had a PowerPoint in a couple of weeks, so I wanted to start by. Is this work? What do I point out? At you. Oh, there we are. Right. So I thought I'd go with some pictures of me as a baby um, because it's just a good place to start. It gets people on the side, doesn't it? So as you can tell, um, that's me and my brother. Uh, I'm on the right, my brother's on the left. We're twins, if you don't know. And um, we were just, I mean, I'm not going to lie, we're just gorgeous. We were just gorgeous little kids. Look at us. How could you, like, look at this. I mean, uh, I know, right? Oh, it's just stunning. Now, that's me. Uh, I was quite a large baby, as you can tell. And that's me laughing at my younger, fatter self, I think. Um, just go, here we are, dressed up, ready to go out. Yeah, I know. Oh, dear. It's gorgeous. Now, I know what you're thinking. Babies of this uh, beauty, really, uh, they should probably be on TV. 
that's the reality, isn't it? We see babies like that and we think, hey, they should be, I don't know, on an advert. And I'll let me tell you, Pampers thought the same. And Pampers went, let me tell you, Pampers came a calling. They saw these two little, they saw these two little cuties and they thought, we want them on an advert in nappies. So they came, came to a, a, I don't know how it happened, I know very few of the details. It's just a story that has come up again and again in our family history. And if you mention the word Pampers in my house, I can promise you, the story's coming up, okay? So, somehow, there's some sort of process where Pampers sort of want me and my brother Luke to be on their advert. And then somehow I think someone's there, I, honestly, this is how little I know of the story, uh, but I tell it every time. And um, it gets to the point where there is someone from Pampers and they're there with us, and I think that maybe they were testing us on screen or something like that. And my older sister, Emma, was there, and she decided it would be funny to keep running on, grabbing me by the feet, and pulling me out of screen. I don't know why or where, where my parents were. I don't know where they were. They should have been parenting, really. But apparently they weren't. I don't know how, to, I don't know how factual this is, but this is the story that we tell. And my sister would grab us by the feet and pull us away. And you know what? It cost us the Pampers gig. Oh. Thank, wow, that was more than I thought I'd get. Thank you very much. And that, do you know what I mean? Because you start in Pampers adverts and you end up in Hollywood, doesn't it? That's obviously, that's the route it goes. So I, I, I still blame my sister today for me not being a, a famous actor in Hollywood. That, that's the reality, I still hold it. Now obviously this is a, it's a funny example, it's a silly example, um, but do you know what, in reality I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite a protective person, I'm very protective of my family, of, of people I love and care for, of you guys now, because you're my family now, yes, come on, yes. Uh, well, come on. Yeah, and, um, and you know what, I've, in the past, things have been said about my family to me, or you know, things have been, you know, even in the playground bullying and stuff like that, where they just sort of have a go at your family. And I found myself very protective, very protective, especially of my brother. On a football pitch, I have to, I have to tell you, I'm not, I'm not, I probably wouldn't be a good Christian witness because I, when people attack, like go and tackle my brother and they hurt him, man, something boils up inside me. It's just this thing. And you know what, I've, I have this, and I've realised over the years that actually I have quite a lot of unforgiveness, which I've justified. Quite a lot of unforgiveness in me where I've thought, you've hurt my family, so I'm just going to, I'm going to hate you, if that's alright. I'm just going to put it out there, you hurt my family. But it's noble because they're my family, and it's a good thing, you know, we're family, so I should protect my family, that's what I should do, so I'm just not, not going to forgive you. And you know, as I've been writing this sermon, God's been pulling up more and more things in my life going, it, is that like me? Is that really what, what Jesus was like? Because Jesus was the most protective person of all. Jesus loved all of us so much that he came and gave his life. We've just remembered it in that practice. But I'm not sure Jesus went, well, if you ever hurt any of my family, I'll never forgive you. And he's really started to pick things up in my life. And I wanted to ask, are there things of you today that actually you start to think of and go, oh yeah, yeah. That person I walked down past on the street, or that shopkeeper who was rude to me once, or that, that person on the phone who had a go at me. And, and when I think of the memories, it starts to bring up something which is actually saying, mm, I'm, not, I'm not fully certain you've forgotten about this. It's quite real, isn't it? It's quite real, and I think we forget about it. We, we push it down, we say, oh, no, no, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not unforgiving. I, I forgive everyone, and I love everyone. I'm a Christian. And I... But actually, when we start to think about it, there are moments in our lives, things people have done to us, said over us, even as far back as school years, that um, it's slightly further back for others in the room. Um, whoops. Uh, and, 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 we, and we go, oh, actually, maybe there's, maybe there's something there. And I wanted to maybe just give you 30 seconds just to think, just ponder about those things and realise actually it's quite normal in our lives. Unforgiveness, this thing, this holding on to that thing that that one person said that has defined you or something, it's, it's quite normal, isn't it? But as I've been saying, I've been looking at, as I, as I read the, the Bible stories that I'm about to come to, I, I look at this, this Jesus and the stories he told and I don't, I don't see that. I don't see him look back at the memories of what people said to him and go, Wah. Not forgiving them. Everyone else, your chains are gone. His, no one. I don't see that in Jesus. I don't see that in Jesus. And I wanted to just imagine quickly a sliding scale of when, you know, the fall happened, whatever. When sin came into the world, 
Because I think, as Christians, we should always be creating more things of Jesus, that are like Jesus, in and around us. The things around us should start, to, the people around us should start to see something in us that they want to replicate. And I was wondering, actually, if we put a sliding scale down the middle of the room and said, this is unforg when unforgiveness came into the world, have Christians moved more like the world and become more unforgiving? Or has the world become more like what Christianity should be and become more forgiving? And I think, as I look back into my life and I see all these little things I've held on to, the words of people saying, oh, you're, you're, not gonna, oh, you're not very good at that. And I don't just hold the word, but I, I hold something against that person. It's normal, is what I'm saying. But my question to you today is, should it be? Should it be? Should it be okay that every single one of us looks at one another and we know we have something against that other person that said something to us? Sometimes we even support each other. You know when that neighbour said something to us and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you should, yeah, you should be angry at that person. Yeah, he should do that to you. I don't know. I don't know. So we're gonna we're gonna go into the three three Bible stories, and we're gonna look at what I think Jesus is actually trying to show us about forgiveness, about being generous with our forgiveness, and and spoiler alert, it's gonna follow that radical statement. It's gonna be radical forgiveness. Let's go to the first one. I'm pointing at the wrong thing, am I? We ain't got our hairs. Do you wanna do it? Right, next one along. So the first one is Matthew 18, 21 to 35. It is the unforgiving debtor. So I'm going to read it from the screen. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And, and uh, people say that actually him saying seven times, that was quite generous. Back in the day, you, you know, maybe three, four, they say actually him saying seven times was about three times as generous as what was usually expected in the day. So already he's going above and beyond. But Jesus says, no, 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 not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decides to bring his accounts up to date with his servants who borrowed money. In the process, one of his debtors who brought, who brought, who brought in owed him millions of dollars. Now, that is, that is not an exaggeration. In it, the Hebrew, he gives 10,000 talents. Now, that is 375 tons of silver. Tons. That's how much this guy owed the king. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Next slowly. Thank you. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to his fellow servant, and who owed him a few thousand dollars, tiny in comparison, and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. This is someone who's just been forgiven of millions of pounds worth. His fellow servant fell down before him and did the same. He pleaded with him and said, I will pay it, just be patient. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you of that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he'd been paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So let's look at this first thing. 70 times 7, what Jesus says. Back, uh, a couple of slides back. Now, 7 is a perfect number in the Bible. It represents God. That's uh, God's number 777. It's like the place three sevens. It's the perfect number. I won't go into that. But basically what it is, it, seven, 7 and 70 times 7, basically it's a representation. It's not mathematical. People go, oh, 70 times 7, that's 490. There you are. Figure 490 times a day. That's not what this verse is saying. What Jesus is saying here is, you've given me 7. You've given me an idea of how far you think you should go. I'm going to show you how much further you should go. Jesus isn't talking about mathematical here. He's talking about extravagance. He's talking about radical forgiveness. Jesus is saying, oh, you, you forgive this far. I want you to go this far. You know that, 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 say, that saying, that song, you know, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. What that saying is, oh, you know, you, you, know, you do something, I'll forgive you. You do it again, screw you. 
That's what that song says. And that's what's been ingrained in us. That is what society tells us to do. Go so far, forgive so far. But any further, that no, 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 they're doing you wrong. No, 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 don't forgive that far. Go so far, forgive seven times. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. If he fools you twice, forgive. Fools you three times, four times, five times, six times. He is saying extravagantly forgive. No matter what. No matter what. You know, the first, as I said, the first servant owed millions. And the seven, second servant owed just a tiny bit in comparison. A tiny bit in comparison. But he still, he was unforgiving. He was unforgiving. He held that in his heart. And he had, didn't respond from the forgiveness he'd been given. Do you see that? The king forgives him tremendously. The king says, I forgive you tremendously. And you can even forgive a tiny bit. You can forgive a tiny bit. And this is what Jesus picks up on. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? So we'll go on to the next story, John 8. Uh, it's the woman caught in adultery. Um, so Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he, as he sat down, he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Imagine having a woman by, well, it would be me, it would be the teacher of law. Imagine me dragging someone in, standing in front of you and going, this woman has committed adultery. Look at her. Judge her. That's what the leaders and the teachers of religious law did. And they say, teacher, they said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Of course, even the Bible said that they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. This isn't the point of my message, but a little side note. Sometimes it's best not to speak just for a few moments. Sometimes it's best just to hold your thoughts, collect yourself, and hear what the Spirit is saying. Next slide. They kept him answering an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but the one who has never sinned, throw the first stone. And then he stooped down and wrote in the dust again. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the eldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I go and sin. No more. Now, what's this? In these days, the, 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 the teacher of religious law, those sorts of people, I mean, they were, up, they were high up in society. People wouldn't have just respected them, they would have feared them, really. If they walked in here, they would have been silent in a second. People would have moved out of the way, they would have hushed their voices. Everything about these people earned respect. And yet, Jesus flips this idea on his head, as in most stories you'll find he does. Jesus says, no, 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 and he, and he paints them, and his picture, actually he vilifies them, doesn't he? He says, actually, no, no, these aren't the people you want to you wanna aim to be about. You know, the trap is, oh, you know, will he, will he condone sexual sin? Or will he have this woman killed and stoned? But like, what's he going to do? Where's he going to trip up? And there's a commentator on this, on this thing that says, actually, by... But not saying either, by doing neither, by saying, okay, well, you can stone her if, if, if none of you have any sin. By doing that, he takes it from a legal dispute, the law of Moses says, to a moral dispute. Actually, what's right for this moment? What's right for this moment? And we all know that Jesus is a relational God. He, he's a friend to us. And I want to encourage you to say that Jesus isn't going, what should happen to you? Because we all know that. We deserve to die. For our sins, for the, for the wages of sin and death. We all know that actually we don't deserve life in all of its abundance. But because of what we celebrated here today, actually, Jesus has given us that. He says, I, I won't judge you by law. I will judge you by relationship, by, by my morals, by my kindness and my goodness and my compassion. Uh, and I just want to pick up on the final word before we move on. Um, Jesus says, neither do I go and sin no more. Now this is forgiveness by Jesus. Jesus has completely forgiven her. But he is not going to be, he's not going to be um, mistreated in that forgiveness. We still, have a, we still have a duty to honour Jesus in his forgiveness. Because he says, go and sin no more. He doesn't say, yeah, yeah, yeah go, go sleep around as you will. Don't worry, I'll forgive you. He's not saying that. There's still consequences to forgiveness. There's still things that go, actually, 
You've been forgiven. You've been called to live a life that is greater, that is better, that is more forgiving and more kind and loving. And as with the king, I have forgiven you of a great debt. So go and sin no more. Go and forgive others. So finally, moving on to the third story is the prodigal son. Uh, I'm not going to read this one all the way through. If you go to, I think, the third slide of this story. I think. Uh, yes, that's right. So a lot of us know the story of the prodigal son, a son who says, basically, Dad, uh, I want your inheritance, I want your money, and I want to go live my life. So back in the olden days, that is literally like rejecting your father. That is saying to him, I want you dead. That's what he's saying there. Dad, I want you dead, give me your money. So it's a massive show of disrespect. The dad gives him the money. He goes off, squanders his money, has no money left on prostitutes, fine living, gambling, all the things, that, the typical sins. He comes back, uh, he decides, right, I've got to go back, there's no food, I'm going to go live with my dad, and he'll give me food, but I'll work as his slave because I'm not worthy of being his son. So he comes back and the dad greets him, and says his heart was filled with love and compassion as he sees his son coming home and he runs to him. He runs to him and the son says, Dad, just let me be your slave. Just feed me, I'll be your slave, I don't deserve to be your son. And the dad puts a uh, robe on him. He says, quick, bring the finest robe and, 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 and in a house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. That shows that you are my son. It gives him authority back. It says, and the sandals represent not being a slave. They say, you're not a slave to me, you are my son. So the dad completely reinstates him. Now what's interesting is, that's, that's the message of forgiveness there. Right? We all agree that. Everyone with me? That's the moment of forgiveness. The dad forgives the son. So let me ask you a question. Why does God, why does Jesus continue? Why does Jesus carry on the story? He's done. The more is revealed. We all know. God's forgiving. Fantastic. Why does he carry on? Let's read it. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed a fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Next slide, I think there's one more. Oh, you're making notes. That's good, I'll take that. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you, all these years I've worked for you, and never once refused to do a single thing you told me, and all that time you never gave me even one young goat that me and my friends could, uh, could kill and have a party with. Yet when, we, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fat calf. The fat calf was like the prize earning of the family. It's like the best thing you could have done. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. That last message, your brother was lost and now he is found, was told about 10 verses ago. So what's Jesus saying in these moments? Nothing that in the Bible is, is pointless. Please understand, nothing. So let's ask why it's there. Why is Jesus painting a son who has honoured his father, worked hard, done all the good things, respected his, his, his personality, respected his, everything about the household and shown respect to his father? Why is he being vilified by Jesus? That's who I relate to. I don't relate to the guy who went and came back and crying. I relate to that guy. You know? Actually, God, I, I've done all these things for you. I've done all this stuff. I, I, I read my Bible, I pray, I serve, I, I give money, I do all this sort of stuff. So how can we celebrate that person? That's who I relate to. And I don't think I'm the only one. And Jesus is saying, don't you dare be hard-hearted. I said it was going to be challenging. He says, don't you dare be hard-hearted. That's that other son is forgiven already. He is forgiven. I have welcomed him back home. And you stand here rejecting him. You know, you can't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours. You can't even say my brother. This son of yours. He is so despising his brother. He is so downhearted that he has missed the point that his son is now was lost but is now found. He's missed the point of forgiveness. He's completely missed it. And so God's message in this story isn't just be forgiven, you're forgiven. And it's a fantastic message, don't get me wrong. But there's more. Because he said, don't you dare let yourself be like that, you be like brother. 
Don't you dare. So what do all these stories show? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because they all reveal the good person, the person who kept the law, the person who was honourable and, and did all that stuff. If Jesus vilifies these people, and that's quite strong, Vil- vilifying a Levite or a teacher of the law, vilifying a son that honoured his father, that's tough. That's a tough thing to do. But you know what, guys? Sometimes that can be us. Yeah? That can be us. We can be the brother in the field. We can be the Levite of the law saying, oh, well, look what the Bible says, God. Look about this. Look what that person does. Hey, you shouldn't speak to me like that. You said da, 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 da. And actually, God's going, have you missed the point? Have you forgotten what I did to you? Have you forgotten what this means? Have you forgotten of the tremendous debt that I repaid you? And yet you're going to hold a throat and hold someone by the throat for a margin of the forgiveness. A margin of the debt they owed you. Guys, this is massive. Because let me tell you, this isn't this isn't deep this can't sometimes it's not deeply spiritual. Sometimes this is just the thing that, that that your dad told you twenty years ago. The thing that those guys in this playground said to you. Those things that have that have caused so much insecurity, though, those things that are holding against us, those thing that your next door neighbour said to that other neighbour where they should have just come and spoke to you. And do you know what unforgiveness is like? And we justify it, don't we? We say, I have a right to it. But you know what? I love this saying, I can't remember where I heard it, but someone said, holding unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping, hoping it hurts someone else. Which is true, isn't it? I think we've all experienced that, where you hold on to that thing of that person. He doesn't, he doesn't deserve to be forgiven. So do you know what? I'm going to hold this. That person doesn't deserve that. He said that to me. He said that about me. He challenged my personality and my everything about me. So I'm not going to forgive that person. Ha ha. I win. And he goes on with life and he goes shopping. And, and you sit in the house. And you get angry. And you think about what you said. And you tell your mates about it. And you're angry. And you get bitter. And you get unforgiveness. And you get sad. And it leads to anxiety. And it leads to depression. It leads to second guessing yourself. It leads to insecurity. I'm being honest here today, guys. I, I've experienced it myself where you sit there and you go, I'm not going to, I deserve, I have the right to hold on to this unforgiveness because he doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And God's like the king, he's going, hold on. I forgave you of this tremendous debt. Tremendous debt. And you can't forgive him for that. You can't forgive that person at work for that. You can't forgive that member of your family for that. When I did all of this for you, and I forgave all of these things for you. Guys, what's going on? Because actually, we, we lose out. We lose out. The freedom of Jesus isn't just the things I struggle with. It's not like struggling with anger, and the freedom of Jesus just gets rid of anger for you. The freedom of Jesus brings health and life and wholeness. And that is in forgiveness and, and your forgiving people. I, I, I put here, it's one of the, sli- the, one of the slides, is um, we are called to be completely forgiven and completely forgiving. We are called to stand hating ourselves but forgiving others. And we're not called to forgive ourselves for everything and never forgive anyone else. It's a two-way street. We have to receive the forgiveness of the Father, of the King, who we owe a tremendous debt, and we have to forgive the person who owes us. Because only in that moment, and guys, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going half assed about this. If we forgive people, we're going to see anxiety and depression uh, go. I'm speaking that out. And people, and, and I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that, um, you, know, uh, you know, just off the cuff. I, I believe that today. I believe we are holding things in our spirits, in our hearts, which is dragging us into things which, which we were never called to, called to be in. Jesus has called us into life and life in abundance. And so he's saying, actually, come out of that. Step out of that. And sometimes it's not about giving more money or coming to church. Well, sometimes it's about going, man, 20 years ago, that person said that to me and I, I haven't let it go. Let me give you an example of... Um, in crazy, crazy forgiveness and what it means for us today. Who remembers um, someone called Anthony Walker in 2005? He was a black man in Liverpool who was killed with an axe. Who remembers this story? 
here in Liverpool. And the mother said, I've got to forgive them. My family and I still stand by what we believe. Forgiveness. That's hard, man. And you know, when I watched that, it was 2005, I was 12. Still stand. I was. And I remember going, yes, that's what Christianity is about. Every Christian should be like that. And you know, now I've got married. And I think if someone killed me, if someone did something to hurt me, would I be able to say that? I'll be honest with you. Would I be able to say, I stand in forgiveness with you? I don't know. I don't know. That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness like Jesus. Being able to stand in there and look in the eyes of someone that's t- taken something away from you, that's hurt you, that's caused you deep pain and grief and go, oh, I forgive you. And let me reassure you today, guys, sometimes forgiveness doesn't mean you're best mate. It doesn't mean you're going to be texting by the weekend. But you're handing it over to God, aren't you? You're saying, God, you forgave me, so I'm going to forgive them. You have, you have your will. You have your way. But I release this. I'm not going to drink this poison and hope it hurts them. Because it won't. They'll move on. They'll forget about it. And we hold on with this poison in our system. And guys, I'm not, and, and, and it's going to happen as a community. We can be a church with poison in us from 20 years ago. Let me be real. We can be a poison in us because look there. We can think it's not the right time, or we can say things, and we can say, you know, we can come to church, we say, oh, I'm so happy for him, but, and, and all these situations, but actually, are we forgiven? Are we let go? As a community? As a church? Because otherwise, we're not going to be healthy, we're not going to be healthy people, and we're not going to be a healthy church. We're not going to be. And my final point, I just want to say this, is for so, so long, people, we justify it. We justify the forgiveness, that's what I've been talking about. You know? The brother justified his unforgiveness by saying, I've served you for all this time, so I'm not going to forgive him because he doesn't deserve it. I do, he doesn't. The other servant justified his, uh, his unforgiveness because actually, well, you know, it's the king's choice. He can forgive me if I want, but I don't mean I can forgive him. And the king's like, but don't you understand? This process of, of passing on forgiveness. And you know, for certain, you know that, that, that phrase I was saying about, you know, fool me once. You know, I'll oh, forgive so far, but not any further. Protect yourself. Look after your heart. Look after number one. Sometimes you've got to look after yourself. And I was, do you know what? I've said that to people. And I've had that people say that to me. And I'm reading this and I'm writing this sermon. And I'm going, was I, was I making stuff up? Did I read the Bible? Because I, I don't think that's what it says. I don't think the Bible says, oh, forgive people so far. You know, forgive them a little way. Take a couple of steps towards them and forgive them. But actually, when they go, no, 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 no. Because if Jesus did that, we'd all be in trouble. <laughs> we'd all be in serious trouble if Jesus went, I'll oh, forgive them so far. You can have three times of getting an argument with your wife that I'll forgive you, and then no more. I'd be in trouble, let me tell you. <laughs> I'd be in big trouble. But we justify it, and we go, oh, no, well, I've got to look after myself, because only when I'm at full health and I'm the best person I can be is that's when people will see Jesus. I don't think that's true. I think it's when people knock you down and slander you and hurt you and say things that just just break you down, and you stand there with your arms open, getting battered and beaten and going, I forgive you. I think that's the testimony, because I remember someone who had that done to them. Who stood with his arms wide open, battered and beaten and bruised and crucified and mocked and scorned. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's our example. Not society. Not songs. Not media. Not all those things that say, oh, forgive so far. But then you've got to look after yourself. Because you know what? If we're standing here and our lifestyle isn't getting us condemned, isn't it, are, it, are we not being judged for being crazy Christians? We're not being told to shut up about our faith. I think we're looking after our number one too much. I think we are. If our life isn't causing us to share in Jesus' suffering. The Bible says that if you want to share in his joy, you'll share in his suffering. 
It's not an easy message today, guys, I know. Sorry. It's not always going to be. But this is, this is so important. I don't know how else to say it. This is so important. So what does, it, what does it mean for us today? And it means, number one, being forgiven. Today, guys, we're going to go into ministry afterwards. And today, if you're suffering with unforgiveness about something you've done, something you've said to someone, something from years ago, we're going to pray that out. We're going to pray and we're going to allow Jesus to break those chains that we were singing about earlier. Because first of all, before we can give, we have to receive. So today, we're going to receive forgiveness because that's what Jesus is offering. That's what the Father offers when he runs to his son. But then we're also going to choose to forgive. We are going to be completely forgiven and completely forgiving. And it's a choice. It's a choice today to say, I forgive that person. I forgive the, you're no good. I don't love you. I hate you. You'll never be anything. It's a choice to do that. It's a choice to, to stand against the things that our neighbours have said about us to our faces or behind our backs. The family disputes which have gone on for way too long, for 20 years, and no one's willing to lower their pride and just say, I'm sorry. Let's be family again. It's going to be a choice today, guys. But it's going to be the best choice, I believe, for all of us. I believe it will, we will see a renewing of mental strength, mental health. It's a massive issue in today's society. Massive. But I believe in the resurrecting power of Jesus. And I believe, you know, actually we take a step towards him and he runs towards us. So let's choose to forgive today, guys. Let's choose to forgive people today for what they've done to us, for what they've said to us. And it's not easy, like I've said. Sometimes it'll mean having our arm down, getting battered and bruised and feeling like, man, alive, how can I forgive these people? But it comes back to that again, doesn't it? What is generosity? It's sacrificial. It's uncompromising. It's unconditional. And it's based in love. It all comes back to that radical love and radical generosity of God that we have to share and we have to example. So let me ask you a few questions for us to think on and then Nick's going to come up and we're going we're gonna to pray. We're going to have some ministry. Let's imagine if we were a church that forgave generously, that forgave not just the mundane, but the extravagant. Not just the soft words behind our backs, but the harsh words directly to our face. The actions which say they don't love us or the things that we, we don't deserve. Imagine a church that knew it was worthy of death but was given life. Imagine a church that forgave ourselves for mistakes we've made and began to love ourselves as God loves us, as Jesus loves us, as righteous people. And now imagine a church full of those people that forgave the deepest cuts, not just the skin deep ones, the ones we've been holding on to because we think it makes us feel better. Imagine if we were a church that didn't have poison in us. Imagine a church that was so aware that we already had been forgiven of so much that we have no right to hold any judgment against others because Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. And when we hold on to unforgiveness and when we hold on to our rights to not forgive people, we're not taking up our cross. We're not taking up our cross. And imagine a church that showed the world what forgiving and being completely forgiven truly look like. And today, guys, I'm excited to say, and it's been heavy, but I'm excited and I'm still smiling, and I hope you are, that we can be that church. We can be those people. That gift, this gift of his body, is like, that's free. How awesome is that? In this world where prices are rising and everything costs you something, everyone's looking for something, God just wants you to say, I'm sorry. God's just saying, come to me. And we go, God, I'll just be your slave. And he says, you're my son. You're my daughter. Let's party. Let's party. How awesome is that? In the deepest pain in our forgiveness, God doesn't say, oh, come in. Let's sit on the fire. He says, let's flip it party. Let's have a good time about it. Because when we forgive and we are forgiven, it releases us to be full of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, all the fruits of the Spirit. And it allows us to forgive again and again and again. So Nick, if you want to join me, that would be awesome. Today, if you guys just want to bow your heads and close your eyes. Uh, 
Today I really believe that Jesus has forgiven every single one of us in this room. But I think that there, and I mean this truly and I might be, even be one of them, that we have a lot of things in our lives that we haven't forgiven ourselves for, or we haven't received forgiveness for. So guys, we're gonna, um, I'm going to open up this front section. Um, and if you're not comfortable, come to the front, but you can't, please just raise your hand. But there's two groups of people that uh, I want to pray for today. First of all, is the people that haven't forgiven themselves for things that they did yesterday or things they did 30 years ago. Something you said to someone, the way you treated a wife, a husband, a child, the things you've said about a neighbor, the things that you've, rumors you have spread. We've all done bad things. We've all done things we regret. And Jesus came to forgive every single one of us. Freely. There is no cost other than declaring with your mouth and believing in your heart that he is Lord and Savior. So today, guys, that's the first group of people. If you are here today and you there are chains holding you back to the past, I want to pray for you. And I don't want to be embarrassed. This isn't an embarrassing thing, guys, to receive freedom in the name of Jesus. That's not embarrassing. So if you're holding on to something from the past, that's the first group. And the second group is for people who hold unforgiveness towards others. And I'm fairly certain this is a majority of us. It's definitely me. Um, so guys, if, if that's you, if you are holding something against someone else, if you have drunk poison, hoping you will hurt that other person because you have justified that you don't need to, because they don't deserve it. Let me tell you a little secret. You don't deserve it either initially. But Jesus says, come. Lay everything down on the cross. So if you hold unforgiveness towards someone else, and you want to receive the freedom of getting rid of that poison, getting rid of that unforgiveness, saying to Jesus, God, no matter how hard it is, and no matter how, how difficult I find it, I want to forgive all those things, then I'm going to ask you to come out right now. Either one of them, come out or put your hand up. Let's not be a church that holds poison. Let's not be people that hold poison. Let's not be embarrassed to them. That's great. If you want to just put your hand up and keep it, keep it up in the air, we're going to come pray for you. Let's not be embarrassed today, guys. This is a day of freedom. I believe that. I really do. I think God wants to take away things that we've been holding for years, years. So as Nick needs worship, guys, the, the invitation remains open. If you want to come forward, if you want to put your hand up, we're going to pray. Thank you.
saw someone at the bottom of the sea, wrapped in chains and bricks and, 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 and holding them down at the bottom. And I saw God with a key and he unlocked locked the, the locks and he, he threw off everything. But the person stayed at the bottom. And I feel like God was saying, you're free. You're free. But you're going to have to swim to the surface. There's going to be moments and there's going to be choices where you can sit in that unforgiveness. Even though you're free. Even though there's nothing tying you down anymore. God has broken those chains. And it's not a challenge, it's a reassurance. Just, just go. Leave it. You are free today. I declare that in the name of Jesus, that every single person in this room is free. Free of the things that we once thought hold us down. At the bottom, and, you know, we gasp in prayer and there's nothing holding us down. And he says, go. Take a deep breath, get to the surface, get out. Walk, live. Don't stay. Don't stay at the bottom. Just go. Go. You're free. You're free.
Let's just pray and we'll go. If God's to work in you, feel free to stay. Just continue to speak to him. Father, right now, I just want to thank you so much that you have forgiven us, Father. Thank you that no matter what we have held in the past, whatever change we have allowed to wrap ourselves around us, God, you have broken them today, Jesus. You have broken, God. Sometimes it doesn't always feel like this lightning bolt, this, this crazy thunderstorm. Sometimes we just stand in the knowledge that you have freed us. That's it. End of story, end of discussion, full stop. You have freed us and you have broken the chain. So God, we thank you so much. And today, God, we choose and we stand in our decision that we are going to be a church that does not drink poison, but that forgives God. We don't want to be people that hold unforgiveness. We don't want to be people that just bring ourselves down with no point. There is no gain to bring ourselves down, Jesus. And so, God, we just, we hand over our rights to you, God. We, we pick up our cross again and we say, God, we will forgive all that would do wrong to us. We will forgive. God, we might get it wrong, but God, we just say we will come to you again. We will come to you again and say we're sorry and we thank you for your forgiveness and we continue to forgive. So, Father, I pray that we would go in peace. We would go in joy. We would go in the knowledge that you have freed us and that you have broken every single chain so that we can go and forgive others. Amen. 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 Right, if you want a tea and coffee, go and get them as our back. Gareth and Kathy, help them serve them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good day. God bless. Okay. Yeah.